Hi everyone, welcome to the History of New Media Art. I'm Jackie Gleisner, your instructor. Today we are going to be looking at computer art. To review from the last presentation, we were drawing distinctions between digital art and cinematography. We were also looking at the ways that many digital artists are inspired by cinematography. For instance, Sheer Nishat's Rapture from 1998, shown here, involved projections on two opposing walls, a format that complemented the theme of duality in the work. Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston from 1989, on the other hand, was a docudrama based on the life of the Harlem Renaissance poet, and it was a hit on the festival film festival circuit. Before we dive in today, let's first establish what we mean when we say computer art. Computer art means anything that has been made with a computer. These days, many, many, many artists use the computer to aid in the process of developing their works. So this term, more often than not, refers to work that was made during a specific time frame. The world's first computer the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer was introduced at the University of Pennsylvania in 1946. Then a few years later, in 1951, the first commercially available electronic computer was patented. Many scientists working on the first computers were not involved in the arts, so the aesthetic standards of these early computers were not especially high. It's impossible also important to note that many of these research centers were funded by the government against the backdrop of the Cold War. And these research centers allowed space for experimentation by artists. Some of the first truly digital artists include Michael A. Knoll, Frieder Nock, and George Meese. For context, here's a photo of ENIAC to give you a sense of how large and cumbersome the very first computers were. And here's the UNIVAC operator console. Finally, here's one more photo from the archives. This is the UNIVAC at Franklin Life Insurance Company. Let's first look at a few examples of early computer art. <clears throat> the earliest examples of computer art start in the late 1950s, early 1960s. You'll notice right away that many of these works have a very futuristic and mechanical type of imagery. That's because, in part, many of the earliest examples that we'll see today were made by people who were scientists, though some of them thought of themselves as artists as well. And as I mentioned, this is all happening against the backdrop of the Cold War, roughly from 1947 until 1991. Advancements in the field of computer art were motivated by objectives of the military. Let's start with the work of Michael Knoll. Knoll is an American engineer and a professor emeritus at the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. He was a pioneer of computer art and 3D animation. He worked at Bell Labs in New Jersey for nearly 15 years. And as early as 1962, Knoll used a computer to make patterns and also algorithms to create art. This is Gaussian Quadratic from 1963. This work was created while Knoll was working on telephone, telephone transmission quality at Bell Laboratories. This abstract, computer-generated image had a relationship with cubism to Knoll. In 1965, New York's Howard Wise Gallery had a show called Computer Generated Images, which included many works by Knoll as well as his colleague Bella Julis. The title infers that not all who participated in the show believed their works to be art. Yet several of Knoll's early works were inspired by paintings, such as <clears throat> Picasso and Mondrian. Here's Knoll describing his work. 99 lines connect 100 points whose horizontal coordinates are Gaussian. Vertical coordinates increase according to a quadratic equation. As a point reaches the top, it is reflected to the bottom to continue its rise. The exact proportions of this pattern were chosen from many other examples. This particular proportion is vaguely similar to the painting 
Majo Lee by Picasso, shown on the right. This is another example by Noel, which was also inspired by an artist. This is four computer-generated random patterns based on the composition criteria of Mondrian's Composition with Lines from 1964. However invested Noel was in computer art, he also recognized its shortcomings. In 1970, he said, the computer has only been used to copy aesthetic effects easily obtained with the use of conventional media. The use of computers in the arts has yet to produce anything approaching entirely new aesthetic experiences. Several people actually agree with Noel. But this would change in time <clears throat> as artists began to experiment with more computer art with the support of art institutions and growing interest from the public. The Howard Wise Gallery was one of the first venues to host shows with computer-generated art, though the space was short-lived. It was in existence for just over a decade, from 1960 to 1971. Wise also organized <clears throat> excuse me, the first exhibition of video art in 1969 called TV as a Creative Medium. And he founded the Electronic Arts Intermix, a nonprofit organization that distributes artists' videotapes and provides editing and post production facilities for independent video makers. Howard Wise supported early computer art and video art, but there are a few important distinctions to mention between these two forms. They are, of course, very related, but their histories are distinct. By the end of the 1990s, the aesthetic of computer art had greatly elevated. Frank Popper wrote in his book, Art of the Electronic Age from 1993, that there are very few examples of computer art before the mid-1980s that are even worthy of including or mentioning in art history. Artists who had already achieved notoriety and critical acclaim were not experimenting or incorporating digital forms in their work before the mid-80s, whereas video art had an early contingency of practitioners including Bruce Nauman, Richard Serra, and John Baldessari. There was an anti-technology sentiment among counterculturists and artists during the 1960s and 70s, ecological anti-nuclear groups. Another reason is that personal computing really didn't begin until the 1980s, whereas the Sony Portapak was available in the 1960s. Another luminary in the world of early computer art is John Whitney Sr. Whitney was an American composer, animator, and inventor who is one of the pioneers of computer animation. Some of his early works were 8mm films of a lunar eclipse using a homemade telescope. In 1960, he founded Motion Graphics Incorporated, which used a mechanical analog computer of his own invention to create motion picture and television title sequences and commercials. The following year, he assembled a record of the visual effects he had perfected using this device, titled simply Catalog. In 1966, he was awarded the first ever artist in residence position at IBM, and he taught the first computer graphics classes at UCLA. This slide contains a link for John Whitney's catalog from 1961, which is a short film that was created using outdated military equipment. And this slide contains a link for one of the first computer-generated films from 1963 from AT&T's archives. Please watch this video, and as you do, think about how far technology has progressed in a relatively short period of time. Bell Laboratories was a very important place for technological advancement, and two other artists worked here who worked here were Lillian Schwartz and Stan Vanderbeek. Both are associated with early computer art. Vanderbeek's Poem Fields from 1964 was created using digitally generated abstract images while Schwartz's film Pixelation from 1970 was composed of programmed abstract images. From <clears throat> 1964 through around 1969, artist Stan Vanderbeek worked with the computer scientist Ken Knowlton on a series of films at Bell Laboratories, which later changed names to AT&T. Please watch the example provided on this page of one of these early films. So far, we have looked at computer-generated images and animations. Let's now look at an example of stop motion that fits under the unwieldy umbrella of computer art. Born in Johannesburg, William Kettridge is the son of attorneys who represented people impacted by the apartheid. His work 
often comments on this topic as well through his unique process. He works with charcoal to draw and erase forms, which are recorded and compiled into animations. And he often shows the drawings alongside the animations to present a dialogue between these two different forms. In the video linked on this page, you will see examples of Kendrich's work. He also describes his process. And here is a still from one of his works titled Untitled, Drawing for Journey to the Moon from 2004. Now we are going to look at yet another example of computer-based work. This time we are looking at the work of the French computer artist of Hungarian descent, Vera Molnar. Molnar trained as a traditional artist at the Budapest College of Fine Arts. She began working with computers in 1968 to create algorithmic paintings based on simple geometric shapes with geometrical themes. Like Knoll, many of Molnar's titles also allude to more traditional artists such as Paul Klee. British artist William Latham creates what he calls computer sculptures. Latham was one of the first to use the computer to create forms that appeared to be coming alive, resembling living organisms. His works are inspired by the surrealist painters Salvador Dali and Yves Tanguy. Latham calls his work computer sculpture, as I mentioned, and his forms often recall organisms or natural forms like seashells that are carved and manipulated within the computer. The Evolution of Form by Latham and Stephen Todd from 1989 to 1990 was made at IBM UK Research Labs. Please watch a clip from this video linked on this page and be sure to look up examples of paintings by Dali and Tanguy if you're not familiar with their work. You'll notice the connection immediately with their trippy, biomorphic creatures that Latham is referencing here. One final example for today's lecture is Anthropometry from 1990 by Miguel Chevalier. Anthropometry was created for Hôpital de Kremlin Bicêtre and it was installed in the shaft of a 17th century well. Two 1,000 watt projectors beamed images of body scans onto a mirror tilted to 45 degrees. These mirrors reflected the images onto a giant screen at the base of the well. The public could view the images through pairs of stereoscopic binoculars. The effect resembled a giant mirroscope that allowed spectators to examine cutaway sections of lungs and brain. Artists continued to make computer art after the 1960s and 1970s, but that time frame heralded a burst of innovation in the field. As computers became more affordable and accessible in the 1980s, more artists started to explore this territory. American writer and freelance curator Cynthia Goodman notes David Hockney, Jennifer Bartlett, Keith Haring, and Andy Warhol were also experimenting with computers in some way around this time. Today there are too many artists whose work rely on the computer to list on this slide, and this is a, a topic we will dive into a little bit more in a later lecture. In the 1980s, computer-based art broadened to include graphics, animation, digitized images, cybernetic sculptures, laser shows, kinetic and telecommunication events, as well as other types of interactive art. Today, the term computer art has little meaning since most artists use digital technology. Many people use computers in some way. This lecture focused on mostly early examples of computer art with a few more recent works to expand our understanding of this term. Thanks for watching this lecture. I hope you have enjoyed learning about the early roots of computer art. See you all soon.